Hello and welcome to Live Healthy West Virginia, the podcast brought to you by WVU Medicine, aiming to help everyone live a better, healthier life in West Virginia and beyond. I'm your host, Mary Ravazio Menard. An estimated six to nine million people in the U.S. have scoliosis, a backbone deformity where the spine has a side to side curve. It most commonly affects children 10 to 18 years old and affects more girls than boys. Early diagnosis and newer treatment options are leading to better outcomes. But how can you tell if your child has scoliosis? Does a scoliosis diagnosis automatically mean your child has to have surgery? We'll answer those questions and more as we're talking with Dr. John Lebicki, Chief of Pediatric Orthopedic Surgery at WVU Medicine Children's. Welcome, Dr. Lebicki, to Live Healthy West Virginia. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you here. All right, so let's start first with the basics. What is scoliosis? Scoliosis is a lateral curvature of the spine, which is associated with rotation as well. So it's not just a side to side thing, the vertebrae are twisted. And that's part of the reason why you see some of the physical deformities in children who have scoliosis. Okay, so well, what causes scoliosis? Well, there are different forms of scoliosis. Uh, I think today's discussion, we're probably just gonna focus on idiopathic scoliosis. And the word idiopathic means we don't know that we don't know the cause. Mm. Now there are some speculation uh, and some research being done. Some genes have been identified that are associated with scoliosis, and interestingly they are on a chromosome near sites that produce neurotransmitters. And so um, for a long time, people have thought that this scoliosis, this idiopathic scoliosis was uh, some sort of a, a neurologic, had a neurologic basis huh. with some you know, muscle imbalance and that sort of thing. Because we know that in other types of scoliosis, like neuromuscular, where kids have uh, um, problems with their muscle strength, uh, spasticity, muscle imbalance, they are at high risk for developing scoliosis. But, uh, you know, to say a specific cause, um, you know, in idiopathic scoliosis, we don't have that. We know it runs in families. It's not a hereditary in the usual Mendelian sense but it does, it is familial. So uh, girls who have female relatives often are more likely to develop scoliosis. And Mm. in the small curves, the incidence in boys and girls are about the same, but girls are more likely to have progressive curves that get bigger. Hmm, all right. So how do you go about diagnosing scoliosis in a child? Well, the first thing is physical examination, and uh, the pediatricians uh, have a routine when the children come for their uh, well, well child checks to have them do what's called the Adams forward bend test, where the child bends over and you look at the contour of the back, and this rotational thing I was talking about will cause what is called a rib hump or a paraspinal prominence, in the area of the apex of the curve. So that's one thing they can see just by just by looking at it. Mm-hmm. There is a thing called a scoliometer, which is a, a little device you put on the apex of the curve and it gives a degree of, of trunk rotation. And that's a little bit more an objective thing. And it's also used to, um, to know when to refer uh, a child for further workup. Um, and then a lot of times the parents will, will uh, notice something like uh, something sticking out the back or clothes not fitting properly, mm-hmm. um, things like that. But as the, as the kids get older, it's a little bit harder for the parents to see because they don't go walking around with no clothes on. And, yeah. and oftentimes they find it in the summertime when they're at the beach and they see, they, they see a kid in a bathing suit. Oh, okay. So... I want you to talk about EOS scans. What is an EOS scan and how does that help in diagnosing scoliosis? And it's, it's, this is a big deal, isn't it? Why is that a big deal? Well, the EOS is a big deal. Well, first of all, the only, um, 
uh, accurate way of diagnosing scoliosis is with an x-ray. Um, and, you know, when you have an x-ray, you're exposed to radiation. And so EOS is a technology that was discovered by a French uh, physicist named George Charpak. Mm -hmm. And he actually won the Nobel Prize in early 90s, I believe, for developing this thin wire uh, detection system. So an analogy would be in the old days when they would take pictures, photography, mm -hmm. you know, the shutter time was really long in order to produce a picture. Okay. And so for this, it's not the shutter time, but the amount of radiation. So if you compare a normal uh, plain radiograph for scoliosis, EOS has about seven times less radiation. Oh, wow. So, so in, in people that need repeated x-rays like our, our kids do, it's a big advantage uh, to have less radiation with each uh, you know, radiograph. Um, the newer the newer EOS technology decreases that even more, and you can program your machine to do have less radiation and still produce a usable image. Wow! So that's the main benefit is the low radiation. Is this a standing X-ray? Yeah, it's actually uh, it's actually a, a self-contained unit, and so in the POC where we have our clinic actually one room in radiology is is dedicated to this because or one half of one room because it's a freestanding unit that has the, the you know the x-ray beam and everything and and the patients have to be uh, positioned a certain way uh, to to get the uh, images okay and is WVU medicine the only uh, place in the state that has these EO scans to my knowledge, we're the only place. It took okay. me a long time to get it. It's pretty expensive. Uh, and there's new, like I said, there's new technology and I've asked for an upgraded one because ours is about 10 years old now, but uh, we're still working on that. Okay, well, we'll, we'll be hopeful. <laughs> um, so obviously the earlier you diagnose scoliosis, the better. So what symptoms should parents be looking for in their child? Well, just the things that I said before, you're looking at deformity. Um, generally, um, scoliosis, idiopathic scoliosis is not a painful problem. Uh, although- So we there's no pain associated? Normally not. Um, huh. But as the curves get bigger, um, especially like the right thoracic curve, which is the most common curve, because of the rotation, uh, the 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 uh, shoulder blade doesn't lay flat on the back of the rib because the rib is deformed underneath it. That's where the that rib bump comes from. And so, there they, some patients do complain of some muscle irritation there, right around their uh, shoulder blade. But in general, uh, even with large curves, this is not a painful condition. Okay, well that's good to know. Um, there are several different ways to treat scoliosis, right? So can you walk me through the treatment options? And are we gonna be using our props today? Yeah, we will. <laughs> well, the thing about scoliosis is, and, and this is where a lot of people, even doctors who don't take care of it, they, they, they don't understand. It's not just the detection of a curve because a 30 degree curve in a 16 year old girl who has been having periods for four years is a much different problem than seeing that 30 degree curve in a 10 year old girl who hasn't started periods. And, the, and it has all to do with growth. Okay. And, and, and the more growth you have, the more risk there is for your curve and, and the size of the curve, the more risk there is for your curve to get worse. So if you are skeletally mature, you show up with a, with a 30 degree curve and you're skeletally mature, nothing to do and nothing to worry about. Um, Why and not? So, because the studies have shown that curves of that size after skeletal maturity do not have a tendency to get worse. Oh, uh, okay. And when curves get worse, they usually get worse during the adolescent growth spurt where the growth, is, the growth velocity is quite high. So 
when we see a patient, it's, it's really um, a complicated thing because we need to evaluate all those things in the history. So we see the kids, we ask the parents if they've had a growth spurt, we ask the girls if they're having periods already. Um, and then we need some uh, objective uh, data that we see on the x-ray of the spine. So we look at different parts of the spine and the pelvis that are correlated with skeletal maturity. So, and, and uh, we also get an x-ray of the hand because the, that, that's uh, known as a bone age. And there's a, a reference that we use that will show uh, what the exact bone age is, which is more accurate in terms of skeletal maturity than your chronologic age, because you know that there are 13 year old girls that look like they're 20 and their 13 year old girls that look like they're 10. Mm -hmm. So they're, you know, it, it's really a different maturation uh, thing. But we have a, a, a simpler uh, thing. We use, we still use the hand x-ray, but we use this uh, Sanders score. And it's a little bit simpler because we're just looking at which growth plates are closed, uh, the appearance of certain bones and that sort of thing. So it's a, it's a big you know, evaluation with not only the size of the curve and where it is, but what's the risk of progression? So do we really need to treat them or just observe them? So the first thing is observation. If you have a, like a 10 year old kid comes in and they have like a 20 degree curve, well, they don't really meet the uh, criteria for bracing uh, but they, they have growth remaining. So you want to keep an eye on that and maybe get another x-ray in a year or whatever, you know, it depends. Mm -hmm. the, the frequency depends on where they are in their growth. Okay. So for a small curve uh, that doesn't meet bracing criteria, you know, you observe them. On the other hand, if you have a person who's got to mature, they have a 50 degree curve, they've never been treated, they have a 50 degree curve, they come in like that. Well, that's sort of the borderline for surgery, but if you're seeing them for the first time, you know, maybe nothing's gonna happen to that. So it's a reasonable thing for somebody like that to be checked like in a year or so, because progression after skeletal maturity is not very fast. It's one to three degrees a year okay. if it happens. So it's not that dangerous. So you can, you can watch that and if the patient has a 50 degree curve, don't have much deformity, and the curve stays the same, there's nothing to do. They're better off not having surgery. Um, whereas- So if you have a diagnosis, you don't automatically have to have surgery. No, no. And it's important to remember that only about 5% of all the people that are diagnosed with scoliosis need any kind of treatment. Uh, oh, and, the, wow. and the definition for scoliosis, it's gotta be a curve of at least 10 degrees or more. So you, a lot of times we see um, patients, they have this little squiggle and mm -hmm. it, it's, it's really nothing. And, and, uh, and maybe, maybe before observation, I should say one form of treatment is reassurance that you come in with this little, little squiggle, we call it spinal asymmetry. They're, they don't really have scoliosis, there's nothing to do and they don't need further follow-up. Now, when the curves get bigger, and our criteria for bracing is a growing child has to have at least two years of growth remaining and has a curve of 25 to 30 degrees or more, but less than 50. So then we would institute brace treatment. Okay. And the uh, standard brace that we use is called a Wilmington brace. Okay. And it's a plastic underarm brace. It's a front opening brace. Now, and there, there are a lot of other braces uh, available. They're kind of variations of this. They mm -hmm. have weird cutouts and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, uh, what you're trying to do is, uh, you know, control the curve. And bracing does not make the curve less, and it does not correct the cosmetic deformities. The job of the brace is to prevent the curve from getting any worse okay. than it is on the day you put the brace on. So, so it doesn't reverse, but it prevents further damage. Right. But one of the things that we found out was that if you take an in-brace film, so you, the kid gets their brace, they wear it for a month or six weeks or so, we see them back and we get an x-ray in the brace. 
if the brace has, has corrected the curve uh, 50% or more, then the likelihood of success for bracing is much higher than if the, cur if the brace doesn't do anything. Um, but that doesn't mean it's going to stay less. It means it's, there's a better chance that the brace is going to work the way it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the biggest problem that we have is brace compliance. Oh, and, and, yeah. uh, and, you know, for many years, there were lots of studies that were published that said, well, bracing is effective. But all those studies were plagued by the problem of, um, you know, what was really the compliance? And, you know, the were kids, they wearing the brace? Right. Well, mm -hmm. the kids say, oh, yeah, I'm wearing it all the time. And yeah. what they did was <laughs> they'd have put it on. They go to school. They go through the garage, put the brace on take the brace off, leave it there. When they came back from school, they put it back on and mom thinks they wore it all day. Yeah. Um, but we have one study, it's called the brace study. And what they did in that study was um, they had heat monitors in the brace. Oh. So they could tell exactly how long the kids wore it every day. And so it is dose dependent. So you need to have when I prescribe a brace, I say, okay, you need to be in it 23 hours a day. Now, we know that that's not practical or doable because you have stuff to do. You got yeah. sports and things like that. But the longer each day or the, the more hours a child wears it every day, the more likely it is to um, uh, be successful. And so... Um, you know, we want to have pretty good brace indications because if you put a brace on a kid with a 20 degree curve and they end up with a 20 degree curve, so, oh, look, the brace worked, but maybe it would have been okay anyway. Uh -huh. So we have to have good criteria. And then once the kids wear the brace, they need to be wearing it at least 12 or 14 hours a day. Okay. And, and it's, it's been shown that like, if you wear the brace six hours a day or something like that, your risk for the curve getting bad enough to have scoliosis is the same as no treatment at all. So, but they don't have to wear this the rest of their lives, right? No, no, no. They so wear, how long do they have to wear the brace? Well, they have to wear the brace until their skeleton becomes mature. And that's where these, these things that we look at, like the Sanders score. So once they get to Sanders 7, then we'll consider, you know, ten, you know taking them out of the brace. Where they really need to wear the brace or the period of time they need to wear the braces when they're actively growing. Okay. And that's to try to control a curve and prevent it from getting worse. So you usually stop wearing the brace when you're done growing? Yes. Okay. Okay. And that's why we don't, uh, we don't ever prescribe a brace like this for somebody who's skeletally immature. It, it wouldn't do anything. And also it depends on the size of the brace because if, if you, if you have a curve that's, uh, you know, 50 degrees in a growing child, the, the brace will never control that. It's, it, there's just too much, too much horsepower speed. to make the curve worse. Okay, good to know. So we talked earlier that, you know, doesn't mean just because you have a diagnosis doesn't mean you're going to have to have surgery. But when you do have to have surgery, um, you and I were talking earlier, you mentioned that you use navigation surgery in, in treating scoliosis. So what is navigation surgery and why is this a, a more effective way to treat it? Well, this is an example of what we actually do. This, this is the actual implants that we use. These are screws that go into this structure called a pedicle. Okay, he's holding up a spine for the people that are listening to this podcast instead of watching the podcast. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's not necessary to have screws at every level, but you have to span the curve, and this will correct the curve. It'll straighten the, the, the curve out. Now, we might have to do some other things, uh, do some osteotomies and things like that, but generally we can get the spine pretty straight, and we, we're conscious of the backward contour, too, so we build that in when we... A contour of the rods. Now, it used to be, and still is, that we put these screws in with landmark freehand technique. That means that we look for certain landmarks after we clear the spine off in surgery as to where the pedicle is, and then we just put them in by hand. Um, and 
uh, you know, it's important that they get in the right place. If you deviate too much toward the middle, you can damage the spinal cord. Mm. Um, so as the technique evolved, you know, we put these screws in freehand and then we would image the spine with an intraoperative CT known as an O-arm. And because we can't really see accurately where the curves go with a, with a, a fluoroscope. Mm -hmm. So what we really need is these transverse pictures and that's what that O-arm can do. So the technology evolved to the point where now we use the O-arm, we get the spine exposed, and we have something called an array that we clip on the spine, and it registers with this stealth station, um, the, the images from the O-arm register with this stealth station, and it's a, it's a, you know, I don't understand all the technology, but um, there are these sensors that uh, are attached to the instruments. And you can actually watch on the screen in real time the direction you're putting your instruments in. So it wow. makes it more accurate um, and safer. Now, that doesn't mean that the freehand technique is not safe. I mean... Yeah. People like me have put thousands of screws in over the years and never paralyzed anybody. But, um, you know, the, the it's more accurate. It's, it's more accurate um, as long as the technology is working, because you have to be very careful with that thing. If that array gets bumped, it destroys the, it, it. It makes the registration out of kilter. And what the registration means is what you're pointing at is actually the thing. So if you oh. if something happens that you and you always have to be careful about that. So each level we check by by putting one of the instruments on like the spinous process to make sure that's what we're seeing on the screen. We're seeing the actual that actual thing. Okay. okay. But as long as the as long as the um, uh, registration is good, it it, it does. Uh, Make putting, the screw, make putting the screws in more accurate. And there are different, there are different technologies for doing it. The one we use is, is called Stealth Station. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's hooked to the O-arm because the O-arm takes the images, feeds that information into the Stealth Station, and then we can go. Sounds very high tech and cutting edge. And uh, this, you know, the spinal instrumentation we, that, that we use now is very strong. Um, it's completely different than the old Harrington instrumentation, although we still have to correct the radiologist. They say that this is Harrington is not, <laughs> but we don't have to use, we don't have to use any, um, uh, external support. There's no need for a brace or a cast in the old days. Like when I started, when I was a resident, all we had was this Harrington instrumentation with one hook above one below on the concave side. And the kids were in a, body cast for nine months. Oh, wow. And uh, so this, there's been an evolution of spinal instrumentation. And I don't, think, I don't think there's much more that can be developed because this stuff is so good. Uh, and uh, so it allows, like, most patients will get, get out of bed the day of their surgery. Wow. So, you know, there's, we don't restrict them. If, they're, if they want to mm -hmm. get up the day of their surgery, that's fine. Uh, because this is stable. It's not going to be any more stable in a day. You know, they can get and up. And it is right and now. And it, it all yeah. depends on how they feel and stuff. I mean, we don't require them to do that. But it's, yeah. just, it's just that they, they often do. Wow. So, I mean, this, that kind of surgery takes a level of expertise, obviously. So can you talk a little bit about the level of expertise in treating scoliosis and other spinal conditions at the pediatric orthopedics department at WVU Medicine Children's? I mean, you've got quite a team here, don't you? Yeah, we, um, you know, this is not surgery that um, the general orthopedic surgeon out in the community uh, does, and they shouldn't do it because we, there, there are lots of other uh, adjuncts to what we do. For example, neuromonitoring. So we, we monitor the spinal cord function throughout the entire case. There are two, two modes. One is called SSCP and the other is MEP. So 
sensory, sen the first one is a sensory evoke potentials and the other is motor. And they're two different ways of looking at the function of the spinal cord and they complement each other. So we know, you know, during the case, if, if we some, see something that's wrong, that we, that we have a tech that watches this constantly and we see that something happens to our signals, we, we stop, you know, and troubleshoot and make sure that there isn't a problem what we're doing or maybe blood pressure is too low or the patient's cold mm -hmm. or maybe there's something wrong with the instrumentation. So we know right away before we had neuromonitoring, we used, used to do what was called a wake up test. And we would, once we got the correction, the anesthesiologist would wake the patient up intraoperatively to a point where they could follow a command. Oh, so wow. so um, they, they get them to the point and say, well, move your feet. And the, scrub, and the circulating nurse would go underneath the drapes and watch them and see so we knew we were okay. But obviously that's not, that's not the best thing no. to do. <laughs> but for, we did that for many years. And, you know, it was at least some way of knowing intraoperatively whether there was a problem. But so neuromonitoring is very, very um, important. Mm -hmm. Second thing is blood salvage. So we use something called a cell saver. So the blood, blood from the womb, we suck up into this specific machine and it can reprocess the blood. And we give, so if somebody needs blood, we can give them back their own blood. Um, and then, you know, you need to have uh, support from the uh, implant uh, people. So we have the reps in the room to help the scrub nurses because there's so many trays of instruments and implants and things like that, that, you know, the, the scrubs can't keep it all straight all the time. So the, the okay. reps help them. And, and then we need you know, the proper anesthetic technique. We can't use gases. So they, the anesthetic technique is called TIVA, total IV anesthesia. Um, and by the way, that makes it very hard if you have to do a wake up test, if they have, if they use that anesthesia, because it takes a while for that to, to be yeah. metabolized. Whereas if you're using gas, you turn the gas off and the patient wakes up, you know. Yeah. But um, so all these things are really important. And then post-op, you know, depending on how serious the case is, some of the kids need to go to the PICU. Most kids just go to the floor, but still they need adequate nursing care. And, yeah. and so you have to have this, you have to be in a situation where people are doing this, you know, frequently. And it's, so it's not like a novel thing every time you do it. So it sounds like expert care at every level of the team. You yeah, know. yeah. Okay. And as far as the mm -hmm. surgeons are, are concerned, you know, we've all had fellowships um, uh, where after residency, we have additional training and this kind of stuff. And for me, uh, you know, I did my residency in the 1970s. <laughs> and so I don't do anything today that I did when I was a resident. So it's a uh, Changes not that only, much. Not, not only mm -hmm. do you have to specialized training, but there's this lifelong learning because things change and we have to keep up with this uh, technology and, you know, reevaluation of what we're doing. So different studies that are done to look at, um, y you know, certain aspects of this. Could we change this and make it better, make it easier for the patient, uh, have a better outcome and that sort of thing. So yeah. things are always evolving. So before we go, I want to ask, what's the most important thing you want our viewers or listeners to know about scoliosis? The first thing is if somebody, some doctor tells the parent that their child has scoliosis, don't panic. Uh, because we have kids that come in all the time where someone, PCP or somebody tells the patient, that they have scoliosis, they're gonna need surgery and they gotta be seen right away. And more often than not, kid doesn't have really anything significant. So you really need to hear from somebody who um, is an expert on this, you know, what exactly the thing is, how, how bad the, the condition is or not, and then be able to intelligently uh, discuss the various options of 
what to do because there are surgically there are other options too we don't we won't get into that today but um and we also you know patients will, or parents will go to the internet oh, yeah. and they <laughs> they get a bunch of information and there are a bunch of um charlatans out there yeah. who are prescribing you know uh worthless therapy uh stuff like that because we know that really the only objectively proven control not operative control for brace for for scoliosis is bracing but these other treatments will be you know available they'll 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 come up on the internet and the parents will question that so we have to you know uh be able to explain that and and uh reassure them so you know lots of lots of times all we're doing is reassure them you know they yeah. they come in they have this tiny little curse they look it's nothing you don't need to worry about it or if it's something bigger then we discuss what the treatment options are all right well good to know thank you so much for joining us today and sharing uh with us with us all this information on scoliosis I thanks think thanks for having us maybe we put some parents minds at ease today i hope so <laughs> So that brings us to the end of this edition of Live Healthy West Virginia. If you're looking for more information about scoliosis, visit wvumedicine.org slash pedsortho. And to find the latest episode and all episodes of Live Healthy West Virginia, visit wvmetronews.com slash podcast. I'm Mary Ravazio Menard, and on behalf of Dr. Labicki and everyone at WVU Medicine, thanks for joining us.